Welcome to the Freak Show, fellow freaks. I'm Matthew Brockmeyer. And I'm Krista Carmen. And this is... Murder Coaster. They say a mother's work is never done, and that maternal devotion is eternal. But today, ladies and gentlemen, let us step into the shadows of that quaint saying and view how a mother's work and devotion can be most cruel and ugly, devious beyond belief. And let us examine the daughter caught in her mother's web of lies and deception, trapped in an ivy tower, lost in fantasy, and her murderous Prince Charming come to the rescue. It is a story where nothing is as it seems, a story of secrets and lies. Today, we bring you the intriguing, beguiling, and utterly mind-blowing tale of Gypsy Rose Blanchard. It all began with a Facebook post on June 14th, 2015, that read simply, The Bitch is Dead. The post came from a shared account between Dee Dee Blanchard and her daughter, Gypsy Rose. At first, friends and relatives assumed Dee and Gypsy's Facebook account had been hacked by some cruel troll who was playing tricks on them. Dee Dee and Gypsy were minor celebrities in the little town of Springfield, Missouri. Gypsy suffered from a rare chromosome disorder, and it was a miracle she'd lived as long as she had. She was 19 now, and doctors say she'd never make it to 18. She suffered from a vast array of physical and mental ailments and was a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the waist down from muscular dystrophy, and had been in a wheelchair nearly all her life. Because of how heroically Gypsy had faced her many disabilities, she'd been honored often. She was the honorary queen of the crew, a child-oriented parade held during Mardi Gras in New Orleans. In Missouri, the Olay Foundation had named Gypsy the 2007 Child of the Year. She was often photographed with famed country singer Miranda Lambert, who would give Gypsy backstage passes and fly her to her concerts to honor the brave little girl. Gypsy and Dee Dee had left their home state of Louisiana after Katrina had devastated their home and relocated to Missouri, where Habitat for Humanity had built them their very own little house, a cute pink structure equipped with wheelchair ramps and a jacuzzi. They'd also donated a van to the mother and daughter duo. The story of a single mother with a severely disabled daughter forced to flee Katrina's destruction had received a lot of local media attention and the community showered them with charitable contributions. They received free flights to see doctors at the Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. The Make-A-Wish Foundation gave donations, and all sorts of GoFundMes were started in the brave little girl's name to help with her medical expenses, including the litany of expensive drugs she was on, as well as fly her to Disney World for lavish vacations, which Gypsy adored. She loved Disney films, often thought of herself as a Disney princess, and cosplayed the part. The sickly little girl often retreated into fantasy, cosplaying all sorts of characters, and attended Comic-Con and conventions, as well as movie premieres, dressed as her favorite characters. Gypsy received a tremendous amount of sympathy, love, and support, for she had suffered so much in her short life and endured it all so stoically always with a smile on her face. Not only was she wheelchair-bound from muscular dystrophy, she also suffered from leukemia and had lost all her hair from the chemotherapy treatments. She was epileptic and had terrible seizures. She had cerebral palsy. Her stomach lining had wrapped around her esophagus, so she needed a feeding tube to be fed. She was asthmatic, had a heart murmur, 
had terrible eye and ear issues, which required multiple surgeries, including having tubes implanted into her ears. She had lung disease, incontinence, GI reflux, anemia, hypoventilation, and crippling migraines. Her saliva glands had been removed because of her constant drooling. Also, she was severely mentally challenged with the brain function of a seven-year-old. Then the next Facebook message came. It read, quote, I fucking slashed that fat pig and raped her sweet, innocent daughter. Her scream was so fucking loud. LOL. End quote. The post truly unnerved Dee Dee's close friend, Kim Blanchard, who, despite the name, was of no relation to Dee Dee and Gypsy. In fact, Kim didn't meet them until they moved to Missouri. Kim, like many in the area, had been inspired by their struggle and the strength and fortitude little Gypsy had shown in the face of such extreme adversity. So, worried, Kim calls Dee Dee on the phone, trying to get to the bottom of the disturbing Facebook posts, wondering if her account had been hacked by some troll, and also wondering who could write such awful things, saying they'd raped a quadriplegic with the mind of a seven-year-old and murdered her selfless mother. But she gets no answer. She leaves a message and waits. Nothing, so she calls again, and again, still nothing. This was very unlike Dee Dee, who was almost always available, having dedicated her life to caring for her disabled daughter. So Kim and her husband decide to drive over to Dee Dee's house and check on them. Dee Dee's car is in the driveway, but no one answers the door when they knock. They begin to rap on windows, peer inside. Nothing seems amiss, but no one answers. This is just so unlike Dee Dee, and they begin to fret. So they call the police for a wellness check. While the police patrol the perimeter, looking for signs of a break-in, Kim's husband notices the kitchen window is unlocked. The police say because there are no signs of a forced entry or anything amiss, they can't enter without a search warrant. But they tell him he is free to go inside the house. So he climbs into the kitchen window. The first thing he notices is that it's very cold. The place is freezing, the air conditioner on full blast. He notices that all three of Gypsy's wheelchairs are in the house, which is odd. She can't go anywhere without a wheelchair. He begins to peer into the various rooms, calling out their names. Gypsy's room looks normal, just a tidy kid's room. Dee Dee's bedroom looks fine, though the bed is unmade and is a jumble of sheets. Kim's husband exits the front door, telling the police that No one appears to be home, but explains just how troubling it is that all three of Gypsy's wheelchairs are still there, which seems to suggest foul play of some sort. That night, a BLO, or Be on the Lookout, is issued. The local news stations all run stories on the mysterious disappearance of Dee Dee and her disabled daughter, asking anyone that may have seen them to report to the police. In the early morning, Police make a statement. They found Dee Dee in the house. She'd been murdered, violently stabbed to death. Apparently, she was hidden beneath the blankets when Kim's husband had searched the house, and he had somehow just not seen her there. The community is devastated. Candlelit vigils are held to honor the stalwart woman who dedicated her life to the care of her disabled child. The news stations air memorials, church services hold prayer meetings. But where is Gypsy? Has she been murdered too? Has she been kidnapped? Was she a victim of sexual assault, as the Facebook post implies? What kind of monster would do this to a disabled teenage girl, a quadriplegic cancer victim with the mind of a seven-year-old? And it appears the vast array of Gypsy's medications are still there in the house. How long could little Gypsy survive without her epilepsy medication, her feeding tube nutrients, her anxiety pills, and gastronomical medications, the pain medications for her migraines? Meanwhile, investigators are hard at work and quickly track the Facebook posts to a home in Big Bend, Wisconsin, eight hours away. A huge force of law enforcement descends on the house, 
SWAT teams and tactical gear. Tanks roll up and down the suburban street and the house is surrounded and then raided. The door kicked in. Everyone waits with bated breath. Will they find Gypsy? Will she still be alive? They search the house and they find her inside. She is perfectly fine. In fact, she's more than fine. And this, dear listeners and fellow freaks, is where the story really begins. For not only is Gypsy healthy and unharmed, it appears she's not quadriplegic at all. Oh yes, she can walk, and she doesn't need that feeding tube either, or the Caesar medications. She doesn't have leukemia, or asthma, or migraines. She's actually perfectly healthy. She's also not a teenager either. She's actually 24 years old. And it appears that she was the one who orchestrated the murder of her mother the whole time. Mine's blown, right? Imagine being her friends and neighbors or her family. Her own father thought she was a mentally handicapped quadriplegic with leukemia. It's fucking crazy. So let's get into the utterly bizarre and mind-boggling case of Gypsy Rose by going back to Gypsy's mother, Dee Dee. Dee Dee Blanchard was born Claudine Anne Pitre on May 3rd, 1967 in Chack Bay, Louisiana. She was the sixth child, the baby of the family, who lived in a double-wide trailer in Golden Meadow, not far from the Gulf Coast. Dee Dee, as she was called, was born with a heart murmur which caused her mother, Emma, to baby and protect her. It's said Emma wouldn't let Dee Dee play outside or engage in any strenuous activities. This, coupled with the fact that she was the baby of the family, caused Emma to smother little Dee Dee in love and attention, insisting she sleep in bed with her, unlike the other five children who were forced to share a single room in their trailer. Emma doted on her daughter, and Dee Dee was sent to beauty pageants, her mother spending the scant money the family had on expensive dresses and shoes, much to the irritation of Dee Dee's siblings. Her brother describes her as a loner who always went her own way, but also spoiled, and someone who would, quote, make life hell if they didn't get their way. As Dee Dee grew older, she became a bit of an odd duck with a goth streak, which must have been viewed strangely in rural Louisiana in the 70s. She was supposedly into witchcraft and had a pet tarantula, and there's a video of her as a teenager on Halloween in a slinky black witch's dress, which she had sewn herself, describing herself as the bad witch and her friend as a good witch. Relatives claimed that she would steal money from them, claiming it was retaliation for when things, quote, didn't go her way. After graduating high school, Dee Dee took college nursing classes for a while, which her parents paid for, though they didn't offer to pay for any of the other children to go to college. She worked briefly as a nurse's aide in a hospital. A bit of a late bloomer, her father Claude introduced her to society at a coronation ball in 1986 when Dee Dee was 22. Then, at 24, Dee Dee met her future husband, Rod Blanchard, in a bowling alley. Rod was only 17 years old at the time, so she's seven years older than him, a bit of a cradle robber. But the age of consent in Louisiana is 17, so... The two aren't breaking any laws when they sleep together. And it wasn't long before Dee Dee was pregnant. Though just a teenager, Rod was an old-fashioned, honorable guy who wanted to do the right thing. And he marries Dee Dee. They decide to name their daughter Gypsy Rose because Dee Dee loved the name Gypsy and Rod was a huge Guns N' Roses fan. <laughs> hey, it was the early 90s. Lucky she didn't get named Axel or Slash. <laughs> So, on July 7th, 1991, Gypsy Rose Blanchard is born. Gypsy was premature, born slightly before eight months of pregnancy, and required neonatal intensive care due to being small, having fevers, and not eating well. Meanwhile, Rod, just a 17-year-old kid, 
He says he realized he had married for the wrong reason. He says he loved his daughter and wanted to be a part of her life, but being married to Dee Dee was just too much. His heart wasn't in it. And the couple separated after just three months of marriage. Dee Dee taking her newborn daughter and going to live with her family. When Gypsy is just three months old, Dee Dee becomes convinced that she is suffering from sleep apnea. She begins taking her to the hospital. Though repeated overnight stays with a sleep monitor and other tests found no sign of the condition, Dee Dee insists her daughter is suffering from sleep apnea, regardless of the tests, and demand that she have a CPAP machine attached to her when she sleeps. Dee Dee also claims little Gypsy has eye and ear issues and delayed mental development, all from an unspecified chromosomal disorder caused by her being born premature. And I just want to throw this out there. I was premature, a preemie who spent my first days in an incubator, and I don't think it really affected me too much, at least. (laughs) (laughs) One of my best friends was born a preemie with the umbilical cord actually wrapped around his neck. He was blue when he was born, and a priest was rushed in to read him his last rites. And he seems perfectly fine now, nothing too much wrong with him. So just saying, blaming all these random conditions on gypsy being premature i think personally that should have been a red flag right from the very beginning agreed agreed okay so Dee Dee moves in with her father and stepmother and her stepmother soon grows very ill it seems she was being poisoned with the weed killer roundup and blame is pointed toward Dee Dee. during this time Dee Dee is arrested several times for shoplifting and writing bad checks She also applies for and receives credit cards in the name of her dead aunt, which she maxes out. She's also caught stealing clothes from laundromats. When the family confronts her with all this, she storms out, taking Gypsy with her to the New Orleans suburb of Sidel. Not surprisingly, her stepmother returns to good health shortly after she leaves, leaving everyone to further believe Dee Dee had been poisoning her with Roundup. In Sidel, Dee Dee and Gypsy live in public housing they pay for with Rod's child support payments. She also is granted public assistance payments for the many medical conditions she is now saying Gypsy suffers from. She claims Gypsy is having seizures, and they are in and out of the emergency room, often when they're not seeing various specialists at the Tulane Medical Center and the Children's Hospital of New Orleans. Gypsy is put on anti-seizure medication and has several surgeries to treat various eye and ear maladies. Dee Dee takes Gypsy out of school in the first grade and homeschools her, saying it was so she could better administer to her medical needs, though we can now see it was so she could isolate her. She claims Gypsy's acid reflux is so bad that Gypsy needs a feeding tube, which doctors comply with putting a feeding tube into this little girl. And I just want to point out how uncomfortable this is and that it needed to be replaced every three months. Gypsy would later say they just pull it out of her with no anesthesia and shove a new one in. Dee Dee can now control everything that Gypsy eats, as well as administer drugs through the tube. Out of eyes of the school system, Dee Dee now has complete domination over her daughter, physically and mentally. Dee Dee tells her ex Rod that Gypsy has leukemia and tells him doctors say Gypsy is not going to live past 18 and that mentally she'll never progress past that of a seven year old. She also claims that Gypsy has muscular dystrophy and has to be in a wheelchair. She doesn't tell him that a muscle biopsy she insisted on found absolutely no signs of muscular dystrophy whatsoever. Meanwhile, as Gypsy teaches herself to read using Harry Potter books, Dee Dee tells her that she's going to lose all her hair from the leukemia medication, which she wasn't even on. And Dee Dee says it's best to just get rid of it all now and shaves her head bald in order to make her look like a chemotherapy patient. Dee Dee also begins doctoring Gypsy's birth certificate, changing it so it appears she's eight and not ten. She also begins to heavily sedate Gypsy with a mixture of Valium and Xanax, among other pills, she crushes and inserts in her feeding tube. 
This gives Gypsy a weary-eyed, slack-jawed look, making her appear to suffer mental disabilities, when in fact, she's just high out of her mind. And I guess it also explains why Gypsy's always smiling. Uh, Dee Dee's sister, after having seen Gypsy walking and knowing of Dee Dee's devious ways and unhinged personality, goes to Rod and confides in him that Gypsy can in fact walk and doesn't need a wheelchair. Rod confronts Dee Dee over this, as well as over the other ailments, demanding answers. Dee Dee, the master manipulator, tells him that Gypsy is able to walk at times, but it's incredibly painful. And soon, she won't be able to walk at all. That it's just a matter of time. Afterwards, she makes it more and more difficult for Rod to contact them. Dee Dee and Gypsy take to staying at Ronald McDonald houses as they continue constant visits to the Tulane Medical Center and the Children's Hospital of New Orleans. Then, on August 23rd, 2005, Katrina hits. Dee Dee and Gypsy shelter in Covington, Louisiana. Their apartment in Seidel is destroyed. A doctor in Covington suggests they move to Missouri. Dee Dee agrees, and they are airlifted there by first responders on a life flight helicopter and welcomed in Missouri as hurricane survivors. Habitat for Humanity builds them a home customized for Gypsy's disabilities and donates a van. Now Dee Dee is far from the prying eyes of her family and ex-husband. And most importantly, she is able to claim that all of Gypsy's medical records were destroyed in the hurricane. She was also able to claim Gypsy's birth certificate was lost in the hurricane as well. Now she's completely free to say anything she wished about Gypsy's medical conditions. Unfettered by past medical records... She can claim she was whatever age she wanted, moving it back another two years so that Gypsy is legally four years younger than her actual age. Although Rod continued to unfailingly pay his $1,200 a month's child support, as well as sending extra money and gifts on holidays, Dee Dee told her new community in Missouri that Rod was a drug addict and destitute and had never supported them at all. She also claims that he was abusive and beat them. She constantly tells Gypsy that Rod didn't warn her and abandoned her for a life of drugs. And none of this is true at all. When Rod called to wish Gypsy a happy 18th birthday, Dee Dee demanded he not tell her she was 18, explaining that because of her mental incapacity, the girl thought she was only 14. Rod is stunned, but not wanting to upset his disabled daughter, he goes along with it. But he is suspicious, and he makes plans to come to Missouri and visit his daughter. Each time when the date draws near, Dee Dee makes some kind of excuse as to why he can't come. Dee Dee begins to rub a topical anesthetic on Gypsy's gums before doctor's appointments, which stimulates the mouth to drool. Claiming Gypsy's medical conditions are causing her to drool uncontrollably, she has Gypsy's saliva glands removed. This, coupled with the anti-seizure medication, causes her teeth to rot and fall out. The strong anti-seizure medication was also causing a host of other problems, such as a drop in white blood cells, anemia, fevers, all of which the doctors considered symptoms of the other ailments Dee Dee claimed Gypsy suffered from, which they then treated with more drugs, causing a vicious spiral. Dee Dee works out a system where wherever they are in public, at charity events, in hospitals, she holds Gypsy's hand. If Gypsy says or does something Dee Dee doesn't agree with, she squeezes Gypsy's hand as a way of telling her to be quiet or act dumb. Whenever Gypsy would later question her mother about any of this, the medical procedures, how she's forced to act stupid in public, anything at all, her mother would beat her with a coat hanger, often striking the palms of her hands. Dee Dee had also taken to abusing the anxiety medication prescribed to Gypsy, the Xanax and Valium in particular. But not all the doctors were hoodwinked. Dr. Bernard Glasterstein, the pediatric neurologist at St. John's Clinic, notices that if Gypsy hadn't walked for nine years, as her mother claimed, 
Gypsy would have no muscles in her lower extremities. Yet, her legs seemed muscular. With all of Gypsy's medical records supposedly destroyed in Hurricane Katrina, Dr. Glasterstein has to rely on Dee Dee's information. But Gypsy clearly didn't have muscular dystrophy. So he makes a note in her file that reads, Mother is not a good historian. That's an understatement. (laughs) Right. He Mm. coaxes Gypsy into trying to stand, and she does, and she can support her body weight. He couldn't comprehend why she wouldn't be able to walk, so he orders an MRI to look at her spine, thinking he might be missing something. Her MRI is completely normal, her brain and spine perfectly fine. He contacts a previous healthcare provider who confirms that Gypsy clearly did not have muscular dystrophy. The doctor begins to suspect that Dee Dee is causing and faking many of the ailments her daughter is suffering from, and that Gypsy is a victim of what is called Munchausen by proxy. When he consults other doctors in the hospital, they say Dee Dee is to be treated with, quote, golden gloves. And Dr. Glasterstein doesn't report Dee Dee to social services because in his words, Gypsy wasn't being neglected. It was the opposite. Dee Dee was over treating her and many, many doctors, nurses and specialists were looking at her, examining her history. So Dr. Gladderstein felt his findings would be rejected, but he does write down in her file that he believes Gypsy is suffering from Manchausen by proxy. And Dee Dee, who is devious and manipulative beyond belief, requests medical records for every visit. And after seeing what Dr. Glasterstein had written in his notes, she never takes Gypsy back there again. So, what is Munchausen by proxy? Let's get into that real quick. Munchausen by proxy, also known as factitious disorder imposed on another, FDIA, or medical child abuse, is a psychological disorder in which a caregiver, typically a parent or guardian, intentionally fabricates or induces illness in another person, often a child under their care. The person who is affected by this disorder is usually a vulnerable individual, such as a child, elderly person, or someone with a disability. In Munchausen by Proxy, the caregiver seeks to assume the role of a concerned and devoted caregiver by subjecting the victim to unnecessary medical tests, procedures, medications, or even physical harm to maintain the appearance of illness or disability. This behavior is driven by a desire for attention, sympathy, or to fulfill the caregiver's need for power and control. The signs of Munchausen by proxy can vary, but may include frequent and unexplained medical issues, inconsistent or exaggerated symptoms, and a history of multiple medical interventions and hospitalizations. The caregiver may actively seek medical care from various healthcare providers, creating a complex and confusing medical history for the victim. The DSM-5 outlines the following diagnostic criteria for factitious disorder imposed on another. A. Falsification of physical or psychological signs or symptoms, or induction of injury or disease, in another individual associated with identified deception. B. The individual presents another individual, the victim, to others as ill, impaired, or injured. C. The deceptive behavior is evident even in the absence of external rewards. D. The behavior is not better explained by another mental disorder, such as delusional disorder or another psychotic disorder. In other words, they're doing it on purpose. E. The behavior is not solely explained by deviant behavior or sociocultural factors. And F. The behavior leads to significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of functioning. Dr. Mark Feldman, a clinical professor of psychiatry, explains that, in his view, Dee Dee, though she had grown up as the center of attention, felt deeply unremarkable. She had very few accomplishments, and there were very few things that distinguished her from others, and that just didn't suit her. 
So, quote, having a sick child gave her a sense of identity, that of the infatigable, selfless caregiver that left others breathless with the excellence of her child rearing, end quote. In other words, she did it out of a sense of emotional gratification. But there is also malingering by proxy. Now, malingering by proxy is when the perpetrator fakes medical conditions about a child or loved one purely for financial gain. In this case, the two appear tied together. During their time in Louisiana, it appears Dee Dee was simply trying to satisfy a deep desire for attention and was simply after the emotional gratification. But when they arrived in Missouri and Dee Dee saw the great monetary rewards possible, well, she readily fell into using her daughter's non-existent medical conditions as a means of financial profit. Gypsy slowly grew accustomed to all the painkillers, anti-anxiety medication, and sleeping pills her mother would force on her through her feeding tube, sometimes medicating her at night while she slept so that Gypsy could have no idea what she was being given. As she developed a tolerance to the heavy tranquilizers, she rose out of a fog. She was actually very intelligent and computer savvy. She was also budding into a young woman. She was 19, though her mother had doctored her birth certificate to say she was only 15. She became active in the internet cosplay community with fans of Disney films. Dee Dee indulged her love of cosplay, buying her costumes and wigs, taking her to conventions, movie premieres, and various comic cons. Dee Dee takes Gypsy to Vision Con, a pop culture convention for comic books, science fiction, fantasy, cosplay, live action role playing, and gaming, held in downtown Springfield, Missouri. Gypsy meets a man there, and the two become friendly and begin to talk. Gypsy confides in him that she can walk, and that her mother is forcing her to be in a wheelchair. Aghast, the man invites her to move to Arkansas with him. Gypsy accepts and agrees to meet him in a motel room that night so the two can head to Arkansas together. So she sneaks out of the house that night and hitchhikes to the motel. But within just four hours, Dee Dee has discovered that Gypsy is missing. She gets into Gypsy's computer and finds out where Gypsy is and hurries to the hotel, bursting into the room. She tells the man that Gypsy is only 15 years old, screaming that she is going to call the police and have him arrested for kidnapping and the endangerment of a minor, attempted statutory rape, then drags Gypsy away. The man does nothing, now believing Gypsy to be only 15 and scared of the legal consequences of helping her. Dee Dee smashes Gypsy's computer and cell phone with a hammer, warning her if she ever does something like that again, it'll be her fingers she's smashing. She handcuffs Gypsy to the bed, only letting her up to go to the bathroom, covering the windows so no one can see inside her room where she is held captive. Dee Dee beats Gypsy with coat hangers, calling her a bitch and a slut, saying she was the spawn of the devil. Then Dee Dee goes to a lawyer and draws up papers declaring Gypsy mentally incompetent to ever be on her own and declaring herself her permanent guardian and caregiver. Now Gypsy was completely under her absolute control forever. Gypsy would never be able to leave and never be free from the domination of her mother. Dee Dee could literally hold her daughter captive and reap the benefits of all the charitable organizations and welfare for as long as she wished, all while basking in the adoration of being called a selfless and caring mother. Little did Dee Dee realize in having her lawyer draw up those papers she had actually signed her own death warrant. Gypsy felt trapped, backed into a corner, and with nowhere to turn, she began to think of her mother's death as the only means out of her situation. Gypsy had long been a fan of Disney princess movies, where the demise of an evil mother led to freedom, liberation, and the happiness of the heroine. In particular, her favorite movie was Tangled, a version of Rapunzel, where the heroine is locked away in a tower by her evil mother and is only freed when her mother falls from the window, plummeting to her death. Gypsy begins to consider murder 
an option. But sequestered from reality in her Xanax and Valium induced fantasy fog of life, she saw murder as a fairy tale ending, something magically benign and not the cold, hard reality that it was. Someone anonymously reports that Gypsy was being abused, and sheriff's deputies come to the house. But Dee Dee, ever the master manipulator, just invites them in, all smiles, and explains that Gypsy's father was a vicious and cruel drunk who would make reports like these to antagonize her, despite her selflessly dedicating herself to the care of her severely disabled child. Failed by doctors, hospitals, medical specialists, Failed by her relatives and family. Failed by social services. Now, Gypsy Rose has been failed by law enforcement as well. She saw no means of legitimate escape. She was trapped with no means out. Dee Dee is now regularly abusing Gypsy's anti-anxiety medication, taking her Xanax, Valium, and Ambien, and using them herself, passing out hard at night, and sleeping like a rock. So the nighttime becomes Gypsy's time. Gypsy discovers her mother's computer password and surfs the net at night. She sets up a secret Facebook page where she connects with people like her old neighbor, Aaliyah Woodmancy. Aaliyah, who was actually the same age as Gypsy, though she thought Gypsy four years younger, was a pretty blonde girl, very sweet and very sympathetic to Gypsy's plight. Aaliyah had always been so impressed by how brave Gypsy was through her various surgeries, how she always managed to have a smile on her face throughout every ordeal. Gypsy lives vicariously through Aaliyah. When Aaliyah told Gypsy she had a boyfriend now and the two had moved in together, Gypsy sadly stated, I wish I was you. Gypsy asks Aaliyah questions like how to kiss someone, saying she had never been kissed by a boy. Gypsy is in her 20s now, though her mother is still passing her off as a teenager, and her sexuality is in full bloom. Then, in October of 2012, Gypsy meets Nick Goodjohn through an online Christian dating site. Oh, this guy. What to say? Uh, Well, Nicholas Paul Goodjohn was born May 20th, 1989 in Big Bend, Wisconsin. He had a long history of mental health issues. He'd been diagnosed with autism and Asperger's. Doctors said he'd never psychologically mature and permanently have the mind of a 15-year-old. When you uh, watch interviews with him, the police interrogation in particular, you can really see this. He's seriously like just a man-child with obvious learning disabilities. I mean, it's sad. It really is. And it's honestly, it's hard to watch at times. Yeah, absolutely. He'd also shown mild signs of schizophrenia as a youth and reported hearing voices. When given medication to control the voices, he says he absorbed them and the voices became separate personalities within him and that he had dissociative identity disorder or what used to be called multiple personality disorder. He had a criminal record as well. He'd been arrested for watching pornography in a McDonald's while fondling himself for nine hours. I'm not sure how that happens. I, that, I don't get it either. Like, they just let him sit there watching porn and playing with himself for almost nine hours. It's like, what, at hour eight was someone like, you know, maybe we ought to do something about this. <laughs> maybe it's when the next shift came in. One shift was fine with it. Eight hours are up. The next shift comes in. They're like, what the hell? You're out of here. It, it must. That's the only thing that makes sense. Yeah, that, <laughs> that must have been it. <laughs> the first shift is like. I just don't feel like dealing with it. I'm just going to wait for the next shift to go in. But uh, also, when the police arrested him, he had a really big knife on him. And uh, that's kind of creepy. I mean, the whole incident is creepy as hell, but the knife makes it so much worse. Uh, So when Gypsy and Nick first connect, Gypsy tells him that she's in a wheelchair. But he's unfazed, and he told her it made no difference to him. He could feel the beauty that was within her. She was charmed that he accepted her wheelchair and that it was her inner beauty he was attracted to. Within just four short days, they were in a serious relationship and already talking about marriage. He was her Prince Charming. He understood her and accepted her. When she finally confides in him that she can in fact walk, he tells her he's not surprised. 
that because of his psychic abilities, he'd suspected it all along. Their relationship begins to take on a sexual aspect as well. And Gypsy begins to send Nick revealing photos. Sexuality had been forbidden to her, and now it had become this raging beast inside her. She sends him pictures of her in a bikini, showing off her figure, photos that reveal her to be an incredibly attractive woman in the prime of her life, not an adolescent girl. Now, when you look at photos of Gypsy and her mother together in various places, on stage accepting accolades for being a cancer survivor, or at Disneyland in her wheelchair... Gypsy always has her head shaved bald and is wearing thick, unattractive glasses. But more than that, she's always got her mouth hanging open and she like cranes her neck and holds herself at these weird angles that frankly, they make her look like Schlitzy, the uh, famous pinhead from the old Todd, Todd Browning horror movie Freaks. Dee Dee would even put a bow on Gypsy's bald head, just like Schlitzy famously wore. And I can't help but to wonder if all this was on purpose. I can put some uh, side-by-side photos of Gypsy next to Schlitzy on Instagram, and you'll see it's uncanny how her mannerisms seem to be like his. Had Dee Dee trained Gypsy to mimic this look? If not of Schlitzy, the famous pinhead from Freaks whose image the Ramones later used as a mascot. Uh, By the way, this Schlitzy character was a very cool guy in the freak show circuit uh we'll talk about him one day maybe sounds good yeah then the mannerisms of a person affected with cerebral palsy and how much did gypsy go along with all this like how much was she an accomplice as opposed to a victim i mean i do think the massive amounts of drugs like xanax they caused her to have a mentally challenged glaze to her eyes And they definitely made her mouth hang open. But I also wonder how much she is faking it, hamming it up. Because when Gypsy takes off those thick glasses, puts on a wig, and stops twisting her face into an idiotic grin, she's actually very good looking. Recent interviews with her where her hair is all grown out and she's wearing a little makeup show her to be quite beautiful, in fact, if not straight up gorgeous. As for Nick, he had a definite dark side. When his ex-girlfriend discovered he was in an internet relationship, she sent Gypsy messages saying Nick is evil and to stay away from him. But Gypsy just chalked this up to her being a jealous ex-girlfriend. Nick was also into BDSM, or what he considered BDSM, at least. He begins sending Gypsy erotic messages about how he's going to tie her up when they make love. At first, Gypsy doesn't like this aspect of him at all. It creeps her out. But soon, she learns to accept and grow into it. Messages from this time show her calling him her master. And she says that being submissive to him is teaching her things about herself. He also confides in Gypsy about his multiple personalities. One of his personalities, he says, was named Victor. This was his violent personality. Nick encourages Gypsy to create matching personalities. So, in a complicated game of role-playing, she does. Her little girl side is little kitty. Candy is her, quote, slutty side. Ruby, her evil side. All of these various personalities had anime girls that she would emulate, posing for selfies with various wigs and props, like teddy bears and costume jewelry. Gypsy pines to lose her virginity to Nick. She's starved for affection sexually and emotionally. She's a beautiful, intelligent woman in her early 20s, forced to live as a teenaged quadriplegic in a wheelchair with the diminished mental capacity of a child. She devises a plan where she can both have a chance to be intimate with Nick, as well as introduce him to her mother and hopefully have her accept him. The new live-action version of Cinderella is showing at the movie theater, and she gets her mother to take her 
cosplaying as the princess with a blonde wig and tiara. She tells Nick to take a greyhound to Missouri and meet them there at the movie theater. They'll pretend they have never met and he'll charm her mother the way he charmed her. And at some point, they'll sneak off to satisfy their young lust. The plan gets put into effect, only far from being charmed by Nick, Dee Dee finds him creepy and wonders what type of guy is at the movie theater alone watching a children's movie. She's also annoyed by how he's following them around constantly. But Gypsy is able to sneak off into the men's room with Nick, where she loses her virginity to him. The two barely have time to make it back to the concession stand before Dee Dee comes looking for them angrily wheeling Gypsy off to the bathroom where she slaps her across the face. Gypsy is rightfully devastated. This elaborate plan to introduce Nick to her mother so that he could charm her and become a part of their life has crumbled and failed miserably. There's no other option. So she messages Nick. Do you want to be with me? Would you do anything to be with me? He tells her, yes, anything. I do anything to be with you. And she tells him, as long as my mom is alive, I can't be with you. Gypsy tells Nick everything, all about the fake illnesses and diseases, how her mother beats her and sometimes chains her to her bed. They develop what they call Plan B, a plan to kill her mother and run away together. Gypsy says she truly felt like she was in a fairy tale and that she was being rescued, but says that what started as a Disney fairy tale ended as a horror movie. They begin to research cyanide and other poisons Gypsy can use, slipping it unsuspecting into Dee Dee's food. They look into arson, how to make it look like an accident. Maybe Gypsy could just lay a candle down in her bedroom making investigators think a candle had fallen over and set the house ablaze. They even researched guns. But Gypsy comes to the realization that she couldn't kill her mother herself. She just didn't have it in her. She tells Nick he's going to have to do it. He agrees. But he says he's going to have to do it his style, which means accessing his victor personality. If he does this, he's going to have to rape her. Now, we can't fault Gypsy for not seeing all of these red flags with (laughs) with Nick slash Victor. But this one is the one where she maybe should have thought this was a bad idea. She does. She does. She says to him, no, you can't rape my mother. And uh, I'm not sure if it was that Gypsy didn't want her mother sexually assaulted out of love and sympathy. Or if she was jealous that Nick was going to be with her mother. Or maybe, maybe she was suave enough to think of the forensic evidence that would be left behind. But uh, what Gypsy does is she offers herself up instead, saying that Nick can rape her. Just they'll like cosplay a rape. And Nick agrees to the compromise. Gypsy sends him a message saying, I'm 100 thousand percent in i'm ready truly that that's really in hundred thousand and nick replies why you say that babe (laughs) gypsy says because i finally allowed myself to accept you're my everything i will go with you and live our dream do this and tomorrow is the last night we sleep alone so nick buys a greyhound ticket to missouri arriving while gypsy and dd are at a doctor's appointment. Gypsy is elated that he's in town, messaging him, the shit's gonna go down tonight. He replies, babe, it's my evil side doing it. He won't mess up because he enjoys killing. Gypsy replies, we'll be happy soon. And after this night, we will never bring it up again. He messages back, dear, is your mom a light? Or a deep sleeper. Gypsy responds, She sleeps on her tummy, like I said, but is a light sleeper, hun. I left the gloves outside the front door, and the screen door is squeaky, so try to open it just enough to get in and close it gently. I'll hand you the knife and duct tape inside. 
Darling, I'm doing my nails too. I'm painting them a dark pink. You are my hero and I'll never leave you. Soon afterwards, Nick messages, I'm here and you get your ass to the bathroom. Gypsy replies, yes, sir. I'm going now, sir. Gypsy went to the bathroom and laid in a fetal position with her hands over her ears as Nick slipped into the house, knife in hand, and made his way to Dee Dee's bedroom. Gypsy says despite closing the door and covering her ears, she could hear her mother wake up and say her name. Then Dee Dee howled, help me, and began to scream. After that, there was nothing but silence. True to her promise, Gypsy lets Nick pretend to rape her, bruising her arms in the process, and leaving a huge black and blue bite mark. They grab a bag of money containing $4,000, mostly from child support payments Dee Dee had been saving, then call for a cab and get a hotel room. The lovebirds hole up here for a few days, <clears throat> where they are a portrait of youthful happiness. There is CCTV footage of the two strolling about, Gypsy in a blonde wig. They film a home video where Gypsy is giggling and calling him darling as he wakes up, expressing her happiness and love. And as Nick eats a brownie, Gypsy lustfully giggles that soon he will be eating her. Later, Gypsy would claim she had taken enough Valium and Xanax to drown out any sense of guilt or remorse. Nick mails the knife he used in the murder to his mom's house. Just absolute criminal mastermind. And Gypsy says at this point, they thought they were home free and would never get caught. The fairy tale ending, it had come true. They catch a greyhound to Wisconsin, and Gypsy says she felt like a bluebird set free from its cage. They make plans to move to Milwaukee, where they'll start a family. They arrive in Big Bend, Wisconsin, at Nick's parents' place, telling Nick's mother, Stephanie, that Dee Dee kicked Gypsy out of her house, and Nick rescued her from a homeless shelter. Nick's family think they seem like a normal and happy enough couple saying the only thing that seemed strange about them at all was that Gypsy was wearing a wig. Gypsy and Nick monitor the news, waiting for the story to break about Dee Dee. But there's nothing. No one has noticed anything amiss. The body hasn't been discovered. So Gypsy decides she needs to do something, something alarming, to notify the police. So she posts those Facebook messages we started this episode with. Yep, that's right. It was Gypsy herself who posted the disturbing messages about her mother saying the bitch is dead and saying she'd been raped and it screamed so loud, ending it with LOL. By the morning, investigators had tracked the location of the Facebook posts and a SWAT team was raiding Nick's house. As they are being arrested, the last thing Gypsy tells Nick is, we're going to stick together, which was a lie. She immediately throws him under the bus. In the police interrogation, which you can watch, Gypsy pretends she didn't know what he had done and thought her mother was still alive. At first, the DA wants to throw the book at her, especially after seeing all the text messages between the two. Messages which these criminal geniuses had somehow failed to erase. <laughs> this is fucking so <laughs> pathetic. The messages distinctly reveal a vicious, cold, and premeditated murder planned well in advance. When prosecutors slowly begin to learn the details of Gypsy's life, unraveling the lies of Dee Dee, they take the death penalty off the table. But Gypsy was still looking at life in prison. She could plead not guilty and go before a jury explaining the mitigating circumstances. Who knows, maybe they would sympathize enough to let her go without any time. Or maybe Midwest conservative jurors would find her guilty of first-degree murder and give her life in prison. She had, after all, conspired to kill her own mother. So instead, Gypsy decided to take a plea deal. She pleads guilty to second-degree murder and is sentenced to 10 years. She'll be up for parole in 2024, just next year. She says she has no problem with serving time. 
feeling she does deserve to be punished for her role in her mother's murder. She regrets it and wishes she just contacted her father and told him the truth. But she says life in prison is much better than living with her mother as a captive that was drugged, beaten, chained to the bed, fed with a tube, and forced to be in a wheelchair. While in prison, Gypsy has reportedly dated regularly different men and has since tied the knot, marrying Ryan Scott Anderson of Louisiana on July 21st, 2022. She is currently writing a memoir. I'll read it. Nicholas, Uh, yeah. yeah. Nicholas was convicted of first degree murder and uh, he received a life sentence without a chance of parole plus an extra 25 years. He is serving his sentence in the Potosi Correctional Center and states he still loves Gypsy deeply and that he always will. And that wraps up the details of the case for this episode of Murder Coaster. Thank you so much for listening, dear listeners and fellow freaks. Oh, just what a wild, wild case. It's crazy. Personally, I tend to have a lot of sympathy for Gypsy, especially as she was so sequestered and drugged. I don't think she could really grasp what was happening. But she's married, and within the year, she'll be a free woman. As Gypsy was always saying to everyone, happy endings aren't just in fairy tales. They're real. That's definitely one way of looking at how this all played out. I I agree with you. I have tons of sympathy for Gypsy. I like don't even really fully understand. I mean, I get that she took the the plea deal and then those were the terms, but I'm just like, how how do you send this poor girl to jail? Like how the mother was so awful. Like being a mother myself, I can't fathom. Like I, I literally cannot fathom how this woman did this to Gypsy. Like the the very weak statements of like, oh, she, you know, she felt unremarkable. That, like that, that one doctor said, and she wanted attention. And then the financial rewards. I mean, good God, that is a whole, I mean, have, I got to do more research. Has any been, anything been done in terms of like, like that seems to me like a sociopath where you have no remorse for what you're doing. How can you do that to your child day in, day out for 20 years? Absolutely. She's definitely has no empathy. She, you know, she's definitely showing sociopathic and psychopathic traits in her crimes. It's um, yeah. As a parent myself as well, having a sick child is my worst nightmare. It's like, that's, and I, you know, to fake it is, it's just beyond my comprehension. Yeah. And it's interesting. They thought of poisoning her at one point because gypsy, I mean, Dee Dee had been poisoning her own stepmother. Yeah, it was almost right. like things were coming full circle. Yeah, it also is always very interesting for me to think like it's really sad when you think that Gypsy happened to meet Nick. Like she mm-hmm. could have met somebody that really did help her out of this situation, and and she and then she really could have had her fairy tale ending. I mean, it's it's sad to hear her say things like, you know. Yeah, I'm fine with serving time. Being in prison is better than being in the situation that I was in. It's like, ah, well, then I feel even like more like she didn't deserve, like she was willing to to do the crime and and take the time because of how shitty her upbringing was. And yeah, I guess yeah. running away that one time and having her mother draw up the documents with the lawyer saying she was mentally would never be able to care for herself. It almost makes you think of Britney Spears a little bit, you know, being trapped mm. like that. And she just felt trapped. And I often think about that, how what a cool, crazy, zany love story it could have been if she just met somebody cool, somebody else who liked the cosplay. Because this guy, oh. Nick, he, he, right, he's right. not they don't, it doesn't seem like they have that much in common even. And um, no, he he was basically the worst. Per- he was like the worst person she could have met. He was the person right. that was going to make this all go down in a, you know in a bunch of flames and she could have you know if things have been different and she'd met somebody 
Cool. Run away to San Francisco and live on Hate Street or go on fish tour or something. These are the things that come yeah. to my mind. Like, you yeah, know, I'm I mean? like going to run away, you know, and like there's a, you don't have to kill her. You know what I mean? No, I went the other. I was like, maybe she, you know, she could have met somebody that like knew the law and knew how to help her and would have like gotten her lawyers oh, to yeah. free herself from this, you know, awful conservatorship, if that's even what it was called for in her situation. But yeah, like just of all the types of people with the different personalities and skill sets and connections and support systems that she could have met, this was like, and you'd think like she already got dealt the terrible hand of having Dee Dee for her mother, like also got dealt the terrible hand of running into Nick on the internet. Although I guess if you're looking, you know, the places where she was going to look for people were probably not the... A Christian dating site. Yeah, the best <laughs> options. So. That's where you find a murderer. I'm yeah. looking for someone to murder my mother. Christian dating site. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, oh. Well, all in all, a very sad situation. And I am I hope she, I hope when she gets out next year, she has a, a wonderful life. I do too. I do too. Well, hey, listeners, we want to hear from you. Have a case you think we should cover? Did we get something wrong? Or you just want to say hi? Drop us a line at MurderCoasterPodcast at gmail.com. That's MurderCoasterPodcast at gmail.com. Check you next time.